I was compelled to bring a message that reflects the theme, since I kind of, I've got all the visuals here already, and so it seems like necessity was laid upon me uh, to do such. So turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, this week the kids are going to be dealing a lot, of course, with the armor of God. Um, as I was just meditating afresh on this again this morning and thinking about it, you know, I've been very excited about this week and the theme and all of that. It's a lot of fun. I mean, who doesn't enjoy castles and knights and those kind of things? It's always a, a good, fun time. Um, I want to take as much as I can <laughs> with our background and theme to bring a little bit more of a serious tone uh, to what this is really all about in regards to uh, the spiritual warfare that we are in. Hey, you know me well enough as your pastor. You know I love having a good time with the kids. I, I like dressing up. I like having fun with them. Uh, well, last year wasn't so fun in the kangaroo outfit. I don't think I'll ever do that again. Uh, that thing was brutal. Um, uh, but, you know, I enjoy getting dressed up. love having a good time with the kids. I love seeing the kids, meeting new families. I love to see our church come together. Great theme. And, um, but... Just for a moment with me this morning, do the best you can to realize the seriousness of really what the context of Ephesians 6 is really all about in regards to the spiritual warfare that we're in. Because um, it is a serious thing. Uh, we, are, we are in battle. And specifically this week as workers, as laborers for VBS, as prayer warriors, listen, we are in spiritual battle for these children. There is a battle in our culture, society for kids. And we want to be the voice of opposition. We want to be the person of opposition to the culture. And we want to be engaged in this spiritual battle. This is only a small part of it. The, the Vacation Bible School Week. And that's what we do. And, and, and all of that. And reaching children. But listen, we're in a battle every day. Every day. Every day of the year for our children. There's a great spiritual battle, and we cannot lose sight of that. And may this be a reminder to the great battle that we face in fighting for our children. But let's turn to uh, Ephesians 6, if you're not there already. Let's read verse 10 through 18, where we have the famous passage of the armor of God. But we're going to focus on, uh, one, in a moment, we're going to focus on one specific piece uh, of, of, of the armor, it's not really the armor, but we're going to focus on the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against principalities against spiritual hosts of wickedness in, in the heavenly places. Therefore, because you've got this battle, because of the spiritual battle in high places, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Well, are we really doing that in our world, the culture we live in? Are we having done all to stand? Are we really fighting with all of the strength of the Lord? Are we really putting on the whole armor of God every day? Are we doing all? Are we doing all to stand in this evil day? Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we bow before you, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for your help this morning as we present the Word of the Lord, as we focus on the spiritual battle and on the sword of the Spirit. Father, we need you. Father, we're in a great battle, and we cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it in our own strength. And that's, where, that's why we're taught to go in your strength and to put on your armor. Father, help us to not labor in our own strength. Help us not to put our own armor of reason, 
on. Help us not put our own armor, Lord, of our own intellect, our own ability. Help us to go in the strength of the Lord. Father, I pray that you'd help us to uh, reflect this morning on this battle and, and the calling we have of you to, to rise up and, and to fight against the evil of our world. And Father, we're told not to just be defensive, but to be offensive in this battle. Help us to see that and to take the sword of the Spirit. And Lord, and to go out and to do battle, Lord, with the spiritual wickedness in high places. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Oh, Satan, he is a wily wolf, isn't he? Um, I want you to think, if you would, about the placement, first of all, of Ephesians chapter 6 and, and, and where we have this in this uh, letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. You think back a little bit about what Paul ha has taught up to this point. There's, uh, we, we did actually a series on Ephesians a few years ago. I, I love doing that. But there's so many great things taught in this short letter. Uh, a lot about grace in the first few chapters. A lot about uh, the church. A lot about spiritual growth. A lot about relationships. A lot about the home. A lot about our Christ-like behavior and all of those things. And, and then towards a very well-balanced, I think we even called that a well-balanced uh, something or another as we did a study on that. Um, but a very well-balanced letter covers a lot of subjects. And now towards the end, he, he starts this discourse on our spiritual warfare. Listen, know this, that Satan will attack us on so many fronts. He will attack us regarding grace and want us to be legalists. He'll attack us regarding the church and want us to dismiss it. He'll want to attack us in our spiritual growth and say it's not really necessary or uh, have distractions. He'll attack us in our relationships and cause fighting and feuding. He'll, he'll attack us in any way he can. It says there that to protect us from the wiles of the devil or the methods of the devil. He has many methods and many ways in which he attacks us. And, and we, that's why we need the whole armor of God is because he doesn't just attack us on one front. He attacks us on many fronts. And all those various fronts, doctrinally or practically, so many different ways. He's against us in every way. He fights us on all sorts of different fronts. He's against us and in all things regarding Christ. And the only way to come up against such an enemy is not in our own strength. It's not in our own wisdom. It is only in the power of the Lord. He says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. In this spiritual battle that we're in in our day, the battle, first of all, that begins in our mind, well, there's a great battle there. We're not even going to get into that. But the battle that begins within our mind, a soldier's got to be conditioned mentally. Why do we have boot camp? Why do we have all of that? It is to train them mentally. They can't go out there and fight physically until they're trained mentally. And there's a battle that begins in our mind in this spiritual warfare. But when we think about this battle on all the different fronts, we must seek to not go in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. We cannot do it on our own. What Paul says here reminds me of what uh, Paul said to Timothy when he said this. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And just before that, he said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are warriors for Jesus. We have a spiritual battle to fight. We, we, he gives us imagery, if you would, of armor. But our, our, our battle is spiritual. We don't literally put on physical armor, or we don't literally carry around a physical sword, but our battle is spiritual. And we need to understand it is spiritual. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against wickedness in high places. We are in a, an attack from spiritual things, from spiritual identities. Satan has all kinds of, of his own followers. And they work on all sorts of fronts. We are in a spiritual battle. It comes at us in the home. It comes at us in the workplaces. It comes at us politically, in our government. Spiritual forces are there and at work. And therefore we must put on the whole armor of God. And because this battle is on so many fronts, that's why we're encouraged to put on the whole armor of God. You don't know which way He's going to attack. If you knew that's... If you knew that Satan was only going to take a headshot, you'd only wear the helmet. If you knew he was only going to shoot at your feet, you'd only put on uh, 
the, the foot protection, right? If you knew he was only going to take a shot at your chest, you'd put on the breastplate. But you don't know what front he's coming at us on. He wants to attack the truth. He wants to attack our hope, the helmet of salvation. He wants to attack the gospel. He'll come at us on so many different fronts, so therefore put on the whole armor of God. A soldier's armor is for his protection defensively and also offensively. The armor that we put on must be God's armor, not our own. And we will not be protected if we fail to do so. He tells us we must put on the whole armor. Think of it in those times when they would wear this armor. Think of a soldier if he went out there in the battle and did not put on his armor. None of his armor. only went out there with his sword. He must put on his armor as well and take his weapon with him. We need all of the armor. I want to think more about the sword of the Spirit. And like I said, we spent a long time with looking at each one of these, but I want to focus on what is called the sword of the Spirit. It's the only weapon that is mentioned in the armor of God. When we read Ephesians 6, there's only one weapon that is mentioned. We don't have multiple weapons. We have one weapon, the sword of the Spirit. But what is that sword of the Spirit? Well, I believe the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Right? It is the Word of God. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It, it, it gives us a typology, but it's very clear about what this sword is. It is God's Word. The, the armor that, that we put on before we take the sword of the Spirit, it is mainly for defense. It is to protect you uh, from the fiery darts of the wicked one. The sword, however, serves as both. It serves as defensive. You can block shots that come at you, but it's also for offensive to come and to defeat the enemy. How foolish it would be for the soldier to put on all of his armor from head to toe, but then go out into battle without a sword. Right? That would be silly. It would be foolish. Could you imagine such a, such a sight as, as a soldier in, in, in the armor going out into battle during that time, and he's got everything on from head to toe, looks great, looks very well protected, but he says, I don't need my sword. Let me tell you what, a lot of Christianity today, this is how we're trying to fight the battles. This is how we're trying to uh, be involved in this spiritual warfare, and it's foolish. Christianity so much today, because we're so, we're so afraid of being offensive, right? We're only defensive. <laughs> spiritual battle takes both. Defensive, putting on the armor but offensive, taking the sword. I'm not saying we need to be offensive in the sense of being rude, <laughs> but it is offensive. In other words, we need to attack in a sense. We're taught to do that. We're taught to rebuke, to exhort, to correct. We must learn to take the Word of God and be offensive with it and, and to carry it well. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We stand back oftentimes in, in modern day Christianity and we're only defensive, just, just trying to keep from dying by protecting ourselves. We just don't want to get hurt. And I, I'm afraid that we've been like that a little too long in our Christian culture. We, we've allowed so much wickedness to prevail and to go on. And so long as we can just kind of hide from it in a corner and not engage in it, we're all okay. Well, eventually the battle gets far enough and comes close enough to where you're like, oh, now I've got to fight. You know, we shouldn't have to wait that long. We need to be engaged in the battle now and not waiting to the last moment. We must be diligent in this spiritual battle. We need to pull out our swords and go forward. The soldier does not go backwards, he goes forward. He must not be most concerned about self-protection. He must be more concerned about fighting for others, fighting for those that are back, at, back home. We have a lot to fight for, men. We have a lot to fight for. We must fight for our wives and fight for our children in this great spiritual battle. We cannot cower and stay at home. We must go out there and engage, and we must fight at home as well. And, be, and we need to fight at home first, if you would against the wickedness that would come into our homes. You fight there, and you must put on the armor of God. 
You must put on the armor of God. Battle was intended for the men. Battle was intended for the men. Men, it's our responsibility, not your wives and not your children. It's our responsibility to be engaged and to lead in this spiritual battle. We must rise up to the time and be offensive and defensive. Now the Word of God, when we take it, it will offend people. I'm not saying we should try to be offensive with an arrogant attitude, but it will offend. It will cut. It will hurt the lost sinner. It will, it will cut him and, and convict him and show him his need of a Savior and show him how helpless he is. We must speak the truth in love, but even when we speak the truth in love, it still hurts because it still cuts. I want to give us some thoughts here to the Spirit here. Let's talk about the Spirit's sword. The Spirit's sword. Now remember, we are in this spiritual battle and we need a spiritual weapon. We're in a spiritual battle, so therefore we need a spiritual weapon. The Word of God is Spirit. We need the Spirit's sword, which is the Word. We must learn to really trust in the simplicity of the Word of God to go deep into the hearts of men where we cannot go by our own reason or intellect. You know, oftentimes in spiritual battle, we spend more time of our own effort trying to reason with people intellectually rather than to give them, thus saith the Lord. And if Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, a very familiar passage there in verse 12 and 13, uh, we are told this, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. I mean, the Word of God, here now it's like it's transferred from the Word of God over to Jesus. Jesus is the Word. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. I mean, the Word of God looks deep into men. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I mean, the word of God leaves people bare. It leaves people open. God's word discerns men's thoughts and intents of their heart. It makes a man's heart bare and open, naked in the sight of God. God's word is spiritual, inspired by God through his spirit. The book is written by holy men of God as they moved by the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit speaks to man's spirit through His Word. When we go out there and we face these spiritual battles, listen, I am thankful for, for those who are Christians and who, those who serve in high places to, to pass laws and all of that. Thankful, pray for them, support them. All of that we must. And vote right and all of those things. All of that we should be doing. But at the same time, we must remember that the Word of God is where the real power is at. That's where the real power is at. We go out there and we face a great spiritual battle as we face men who are dead to God. And we must seek to unite them to God by pointing them to spiritual words of life. I want you to look at John chapter 6. You know, a person said this many years ago. And I was actually, we went through a, a rough time at the church I was currently at, and I went to a meeting. And, and a man there preached on the sword of the Spirit. And he said this one thing, very interesting to me, and stuck with me this whole time. And he just says, you want to bring about a change of law, you must have a change of heart. <laughs> it was so simple. But at that point in my ministry, it was just, the church had decided some things that wasn't good, I knew it wasn't right. I'm like, boy, this needs a change. But then it was just a reminder to me what needed to change was not the laws, the rules we had made, what needed to change was the hearts that were in the pews. And when the hearts in the pews change, then laws change. Now that's in a smaller scale of a church, but it works in a larger scale of a community, of a country. What do we really want for America? We want just good laws to be passed? We just want a good a society so that everybody can live comfortably? Or do we want people's hearts to be changed by the power of the gospel and men to go from death unto life? Of course we all want a better culture, a better society where wickedness isn't abounding. Of course we want that. But what we should want more is for hearts to change. 
for people to get saved by the grace of God and through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What good will it do if we pass all kinds of laws and everything kind of calms down and kind of steadies out and we're all good and safe and no threats and well, we can just go on living our life well and with you know, no threat of the government or anything like that or attack on a morality against our children, but then people are still lost and going to hell. We must be after the change of hearts. And the only thing that does that is the Word of God. In John chapter 6, I want you to see something here. The follower, or people following Jesus. And let's start with verse 60. I want you to see this. It says, Therefore many of His disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in Himself that His disciples complained about this, about what He was saying, He said to them, Does this offend you? Let me, let me tell you what, the Word of God is going to offend people. We, we want this Christianity that never, that never offends. Folks, that wasn't Jesus. That wasn't Jesus. He spoke the Word. And the Word offends. It goes against us. He says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where He was before? Basically, if you can't take the Word of God, you, you, you can't. You can't really see me. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So the Spirit offends, but the Spirit also gives life. The words that I speak to you are Spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. See, people have got to be transferred, or they need to be transformed, and they need to have faith, or they will get continually offended at the Word of God. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray Him. And He said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted to Him by My Father from that time. You know, a lot, a lot of people you teach that verse 65. It really turns a lot of people off. They say, well, I don't want to hear that. Well, it happened then too. From that time many, not just Judas, but this wasn't Judas. Judas is later. When you first read it, you think, well, you know, he's talking about Judas, you know. No, wrong context. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Here, right here's one place where he just loves Simon Peter, right? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe. And know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Folks, when people do not believe that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, they will become very offended at His words. It begins with knowing who He is. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. A lot of people have that wrong, even underneath the guise of Christianity. Listen, because people couldn't receive the word of Christ, we see that some had quit following Him. They, they gave the appearance of being disciples and following Jesus for a while, but when the Word of God offended them, they turned away. They were saying, who can hear His words? I think that the words they were speaking were hard words. I mean, difficult words to hear. But also, I think His words were hard to understand in, in that point, because it is impossible for the natural man to really hear the Word of God, as taught in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Man must be born of the Spirit of God to truly grasp the truth of God and the spiritual nature of the Word. So, so the Word of God brings life and the Word of God is alive unto people who are made alive by it. I like what Zechariah says, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The word of God is powerful. We do not need to underestimate that. If, do we believe Genesis and the first few chapters? Do we believe that? In the beginning, God said. That's the word spoken. Let there be light. Listen. We want light to shine in darkened hearts. This world is in 
complete darkness. But the Word of God is powerful. And He can command the light to shine in darkness. The gospel of light is what we must proclaim. It is the Spirit of God. That's what the Spirit of God uses. It is the weapon. It is the sword. Proclaiming the gospel of light. That's what our world, what our culture needs more than anything. So the gospel must be central to all of our outreach, to all of our ministry, to our homes. Because it is the light that shines on darkened hearts. And if people get offended by that, we can't do anything about that. All natural men will become offended by it. And again, we are not to be arrogant or, or, or anything like that. But you can be as nice as possible. And the truth offends. The truth hurts. Let's talk about using this sword a little bit. Using the sword. First of all, to use the sword, you've got to be close to really use it effectively. I mean, the, 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 the other armor you have, the armor you have on, that's so you can get close. I mean, imagine those times. You know, you didn't have, you know, guns, you know. You had to get close. So the armor that you put on is so that you can get close so that you can use the sword. So the armor is for protection, defense. Ephesians 6 talks about the enemy's weapon, which is fiery darts. And those fiery darts would be shot from bows at a distance so that you couldn't get close to use your sword. They were arrows that were on fire and, and shot at great distances, hoping to, to hit the mark before uh, the enemy even got close. Well, when you think about this for just a moment, and it shows the importance, really, of, of all the other pieces of armor. We don't just take up the sword, either. Well, we are to take on the whole armor of God. It is defensive and offensive. We must seek to put on the armor, that practical righteousness, and, and be clothed in the righteousness of Christ as well. We must put on the helmet of salvation and the, the hope that we have in the gospel. We must go out ready to share the gospel. We need that breastplate of righteousness. We're not going to get into all of that, but a lot of that is practical. Christianity is what it's talking about and putting on Jesus Christ each and every day. We need that personal holiness as, as we go out into this battle and so we can get close to others to use the sword. You know, a lot of times people think that, that to engage in a spiritual battle, they, they got to get really close to the world, but their idea of close to the world is being like the world. Well, if I just cave a little bit on this righteousness, if I just cave a little bit on this holiness and let down my standards, then I can get closer to people. If I go to the bar and drink with them, maybe they'll listen to, to me about Jesus. <laughs> How foolish for you to think so. You will never be able to be used of God like that. Some people will not hear the Word of God sometimes because our life is obviously without the armor of God. We don't walk in truth. We don't walk in righteousness. And so they won't even hear the Word of God. And, and the, world, the world, listen, the world sees the hypocrisy of that. When you're sitting there trying to tell someone about Jesus and the power of the gospel, and you're not living out the power of the gospel in your life, and you're living like the devil, what kind of influence can you possibly think you can have? To any good. In Titus chapter 2, Paul tells the young preacher this in verse 6 and 8. Titus 2, verse 6 and 8. He says, uh, Likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Show a pattern of good works. When people look at your overall life, as I say you have to be perfect before you witness to somebody, but our overall pattern should be of a good testimony, a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. I mean, some of you, I don't know, I hope not, but some of you might be using foul language out there, words Christians ought not to be using. And then a little bit later, you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus. Listen, cursing and blessing should not come out of the same mouth. I mean, we... He says, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Then he says, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. Listen, we're going to get close to people to use the word of God. We've got to put on that armor that's talked about there. 
so we can get close to them and share the word of God with them. Sometimes people are already rejecting the words we're about to speak because of the life that we've been living. We've got to be on guard against that. Now, while we need that personal holiness and that armor of God and all of those things that will be talked about this week so we can get close to people and be without that reproach, when we do get close to them, we must then use the sword. It's not all about personal testimony. It's not all about looking good. I mean, the armor looks good, right? But it's not all about, it's not about just looking good or, or looking holy or looking godly. If we live godly lives and and are around some lost people, but we never pull out the sword, we're not going to accomplish much good. We need to pull out the sword and tell them about who has changed us. Tell them about who we serve. Tell them about the Word of God. Tell them about Jesus. So that He gets the glory, and not us, because we're just these really good people. So it brings us to our next thought. Not only using the sword, you need to be close to people to use it, but... We need to know our weapon. Now today, soldiers are tested and tried on their knowledge of their weapon. Could you imagine going out to battle <laughs> with a sword? That's the first time you picked one up. I mean, it wouldn't have been too easy. I mean, they'd have training. They'd have practices. I mean, they'd have that all the time before they go out to battle. Soldiers are tested and tried of their knowledge of their weapon and their usage of it. They need to know that weapon well. I, what I understand today is like, like our soldiers, they got to learn how to take their, their weapons apart in the dark and put them back together without even looking at it. I mean, so they got, they got to know it well. You know, David said that he would meditate upon the Lord in the night. He knew his weapon well. We need to know the Word of God enough so that we can shut our eyes in the dark and meditate upon it. How well do you know your weapon? Do you know it in the dark? Can you shut your eyes and lay there at night with your head upon your pillow and just scriptures running through your mind that you can meditate upon? I'm not saying I fall asleep like that every night, <laughs> but it is nice when I do. But can you close your eyes and do that? Because the Word of God is so deep within you, you know it well. And you can, you can lay there with your eyes closed, you can think about it, you can pray about it. Folks, you need that. You need to know your weapon well. When you know someone, you can think about them when they're, not very, when they're not even present, if you know them well. We should know God's Word enough so that without the Bible in hand, we can shut our eyes and just meditate upon the Lord, His character, His promises, His glory, His power. To know our weapon, we need to commit some memory to it. Memorizing the Word of God is probably one of the best things we can do, and I think we lack that a lot. And I think we've lacked that a lot in teaching our children that. God said in Hosea that His people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need to know the Word of God well. We don't need just a, a feel-good Christianity that is very surfacy and lacks real depth and, and knowledge of God's Word. We don't want a Christianity where we just come into the services and we all feel real good about we did something for Jesus while we were here in worship and we go out and that's all there is to it the rest of the week. We must be in the Word of God every day. Every day. We must desire the Word of God, to dig into the Word of God every day. Not be content with just a little bit of the Word, but, but to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Are you knowing your weapon? Are you putting it in your heart? Man, if you're wanting to truly be the warriors of your home, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You must know Him, trust Him, follow Him, and listen to your commander-in-chief every day and what he says to you from his word get in the word of god lead your homes protect your homes with the word of god you know the soldier and to know his weapon well he would practice with it a soldier as we said he, he would they would have practice and practice battles and such so when he entered into battle i know when you go when you go hunting the same thing you go out there with, with a weapon you want to Make sure you know your weapon well. You've shot it before. But you, you can't just disregard the Word of God all week and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a conversation on Friday or Saturday with somebody that's spiritual and think you're just you're going to be able to do this. 
We need to practice with it every day. We need to be in it every day so that when the battle happens, we're ready. If it happens on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, we're ready. We might go out here on Sunday morning and feel like we can conquer the world. And I think sometimes we do feel like that. But listen, we need to be in the Word of God every day. Practice with it. Be in it. Meditate upon it. Know it well. As you get to know your weapon better, you begin to practice with it. You get better at using it. And, and you know, you, you, there's no better thing than to practice, right? I mean, and so I want to say this, even when you see that battle coming, you don't just ignore it because, you know, you don't think you're good enough yet. <laughs> Listen, you might fall on your face sometimes, and you might feel like at the end of the conversation, people might have got the best of you at times. But, but that, that's one defeat, you know? I mean, keep giving the Word of God. Make sure you're sharing the Word of God, and maybe you weren't as defeated as you think you were. <laughs> Sometimes I've let battles thought I was defeated only to find out that it defeated them and the Lord used it. But be in the Word of God. Practice with it. Don't wait until you're the best before you ever share it. You, can't, you don't have to wait until you know everything about God's Word. Practice with it. Practice with it. You know, when, I, when deer season comes in, you start practicing with your bow... You always start off close, you know. You start off close, and then as you get better, you work your way out to hit the target further. It takes me a long time to get out to that 80-yard range with my bow. I am still, still haven't got there yet, by the way. I'm still trying to get at 30, so anyhow. But, you know, when you feel confident in your weapon, a lot of times I practice and practice and practice, and then I'll go out in my yard, pull back my bow right before I go hunting, shoot it one, one, just one time. Probably didn't do me much good, but it gave me a little bit of confidence. Folks, we need to be in the Word of God constantly. I, I, love, I love David when he faced Goliath. I'm almost done here, but I want, I want to read a little bit of this in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel. It's been a long time since I read anything about David and Goliath here. might be because we sang about David and Goliath and we were walking down the uh, trail the other day. Uh, I don't know where it came from. We started singing about David and Goliath. Have a, you, you all seen that in the Sunday school class, David and Goliath? You ever seen that? You little ones seen that? Yes? No? Only a boy named David? Yeah, yeah. And we were singing that song. Um, but in 1 Samuel 17, verse 32... David, David went, when he went to finally come, we're not going to read the whole account, we're only going to read a few verses, but when David finally goes and, and, and faces Goliath, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He went in the power and the strength of the Lord. Okay? That's what we are to do. But David also went if, with a stone and a sling, really to show how great God was. It wasn't really to show how great David was. It just showed how great God was. God was with him. God's presence was there. The Lord of hosts was with him. And the Lord of hosts can use a little boy with a sling, with a, with a sling, with a, with a sling and a stone to take down a Goliath. It wasn't to show how wonderful David was, but there was some practical things on David's side there that we can highlight and learn from. But in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 32 says here, then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Let me tell you what, young people, I want you to know this. You can go out and face the great battles of our culture, but you've got to, you've got to know your weapon well. We need to make sure our young people know their weapon well, the word of the living God. And David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, after it. He, didn't, he went, he went to, to capture it. David, as a young man, was so in love with these little sheep that when a bear or a lion would come and take them away, David went after it. He wasn't just about protecting himself. He went after it to protect that little sheep. 
out of the mouth of the lion and the bear. I like that imagery there. David is courageous, and David is wanting to protect this young, a young uh, lamb. Let me tell you what, we have some young lambs in our congregation. A lot of young lambs in our congregation that the lion wants very badly. And sadly, sometimes it seems like he snatches them. And we got to do what we can to go after and to fight. He said, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and, and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. That's all David needed. So Saul clothed David with his armor and, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. I mean, he's putting this armor on him, right? David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. He wasn't familiar with it. Listen, David became very familiar with a sword later, okay? But at this point, he's not familiar with this. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And you know the rest of the story, right? He takes, he, he takes his stone, stone and his sling and he goes out and he faces Goliath. David was more comfortable with just a stone at this time and a sling because he had proven it. It had been tested. He knew it well. I can see David as a young boy being trained and training himself with a stone and sling and, and hitting trees, you know, and rocks and stuff and aiming them constantly. And then finally, as he's out there with the sheep and, and maybe even taking little pebbles and, and even hitting the sheep sometimes, just a, little, just a little bit just to get him in line. Just a whoo you know, get him in line. All kinds of things you could do with that. And practicing. And then the lion comes and the bear comes. He's ready. He's been practicing. He knows his weapon well. And then finally, he's been proven in that. And now he faces a real Goliath. Folks, listen, the training of our children starts while they're young at home. And it may be in the smaller things, of, like David hitting the trees and the rocks, and then it becomes bigger, and it becomes more real and, and more threatening, and they have their lions, and, and they have their bears, and they have their Goliaths. Listen, we need to be preparing our children with the Word of God right now, as young as we can, that they might know their weapon well, Listen, you can't do enough to get the Word of God in your children. Our children need this book more than they need anything. You need to make sure that they can hear it as often as possible. I don't have time to turn there. Well, I do. I'll just I'll take a couple minutes here. But in 2 Timothy 3, real quick. In 2 Timothy 3, it famous passage here for end times, perilous times shall come. And we, we, we see this today. And, and he says in 2 Timothy 3, then perilous times or dangerous times will come. And we see this taking place. Lovers, men should be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, of disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Dangerous times. You have people like that, you got dangerous times. Wow, what terrible, terrible things, right? What do our kids our kids are facing times like this? But listen, Paul gives Timothy hope and gives us instruction. When you read on down, he says, on down, he says, resist these types in the truth in verse 8 there's part of the armor men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was but then he goes on he talks about there about how hey, you've known me you've known my example you've known my love etc my perseverance you've known what i've been through he says and those who live godly will suffer persecution in verse 12 
He says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Back to the end time stuff. It's going to get bad. Bad news. It's going to get worse. So what do we do? But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Folks, listen. The world is getting worse and worse, and all the more we need to put more and more and more and more of the Word of God into our children. That's, that's the only thing that's going to help them to face all of that. He said, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And talks about all scripture being profitable that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Folks, well, we do have a terrible battle out there coming at us on all kinds of fronts. But the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is our only hope in offensively winning this battle. We need a defense armor. Not get into that today. Didn't have time. But we must take the word of God. It's what God can use in your child's heart to change them from the inside. Listen, when, when, when your kids are little, you can make them do a lot of things. As they get a little older, you realize you can't make them do as much. And what you really need to pray for and seek after is that God would change their heart. Because a change of heart will change their life. You know, anytime you correct your children, you, sh you should get, try to get to the heart of the matter. Not just correct behavior. But why are they doing what they're doing? And how that it offends God. Teach them about repentance and forgiveness. How young? Very young. Two? Three? You're teaching them the gospel. Teaching them repentance. Teaching them what Jesus did. Teaching them about how we shouldn't sin against God. And leading them to Christ at a very, very, very young age. And instilling the word of God in them at that young of an age. That's the only hope of our kids. Let's share it. We're in a battle. Father, use this message today for your honor and for your glory. And help us understand how important it is to take your word and to share it at home with our children, in our community, our work, our jobs. Help us to be diligent. Help us not to be just defensive, wear armor and hide in the corner. But let's go forward and march as soldiers with your sword. We have a great battle before us, a great spiritual battle. And the only thing that can win a spiritual battle is the living word of God that divides asunder the thoughts and intents of men's hearts and makes them bare and open before the all-seeing God. Help us to go out with confidence in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, please, as we sing.